seated. The title of my message this morning is The Great Pursuit. And, um, you know, in this society, we're always going after something, right? And this society is always going after us. If you're on social media, I, you know, it's crazy how the Internet works. Because it kind of like it tracks what you like and don't like, right? So you search for golf clubs, you know, and then for the next three months, it's like golf club stuff come up, you know. It's like, oh, my God, it, you were looking for something, but now it's like pursuing you. It's like uh, their great pursuit is to get your money. <laughs> but we have a great pursuit, you know, and that's to go after God. That's to go after God. This week, Sister Mitzi closed it out, and, man, it was so powerful, and I know the women will rise up, but we know the men. We're, we got your back, man. We're, we're here to back you up. But it, it was just heavy because she said, you know, we're not praying for revi revival. We're not believing for revival. We're in revival. And now when she said that, I was just like, man, we are. You know, we are in revival. I got saved in a revival. I got saved back in 19, that's funny how it's so far, 1990, December of 1995. A long time ago. I was 16 years old. And and I got saved, and I just thought this was normal. You know, I got saved. The church, the, the youth ministry I got saved in had four or 500 people. You know, that was just a normal Wednesday night youth. On a Wednesday night, we were getting four to 500 people. And Pastor Sunny Jr. was my youth pastor. And Sister Georgina and Pastor Al were p youth uh, leaders and you know, all these great people at the time were just youth leaders at the time. And I was just getting saved. I got saved in this. You know, I didn't help usher it in. So I thought that was normal. It wasn't until like maybe five years, maybe 10 years ago, I realized that we had gotten saved in the middle of a revival. Man, that's heavy. I wish I would have known it at the time. I wish I would have just uh, soaked that, that moment in. I didn't realize it till later. And so when Sister Mitzi said that, that we were in a revival, I was like, man, I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss this moment. I don't want to miss what God is doing right now. And I want to jump in. I don't want to be distracted. And I don't want to be, you know, full of excuses. And I don't want to get stopped by anything. But I want to be in it now. And God has called all of us to be a part of what's taking place. Amen. Uh, my, my scripture this morning is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. And it says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Amen. You not just oh, those of you that are called live worthy because you're called. You know, you're, you're called to the ministry, you, you're a minister, or you're, you know, you're a, you serve in the church. No, no, no. It says you have been called. Every one of us that read this word, we have been called by God. God, and I love that. I love the fact that, that I know that when I was in my mother's womb, the word of God says that he knew me. He, he knew every part of me and he created me with a purpose. He created us with a purpose and we have been called by God set apart to do something for him not to chase after money not to chase after fame or positions but to pursue him and his calling amen there was a cry that went out it goes out even now into the heavens it's a cry for hope and a cry for true love a cry of deliverance from violence, from drug addiction, from chaos, from perversion, from alcoholism, hopelessness, from a place that is broken and confused. That place is here. It's San Diego. It's our city. The cry is great. And, I, and I'm, a, I'm a missionary at heart. You know, my husband, he likes nice things. But he'll be like, oh, you're a missionary. You don't, you don't need it, right? <laughs> I'm like all in rags, just kidding. <laughs> but I'm a missionary at heart, and I love the mission field. And I'm just like, I love, I, I, I'm part of Mexico. I help with the gang girls out there. And I love going to Mexico and, you know, with my broken Spanish and, and sharing with the girls. And I love the mission field. But when I was at, at this retreat, God began to show me, God, there's a mission field around you. 
If you go out Plaza, you're in the Philippines. You go down to Chicano Park, you're in Mexico. You know, God, the, the four corners of the earth is right here in San Diego, right here for us. And God has called us. Either, either God has placed some of, a lot of us have come here from afar. How many of you are not originally from San Diego? Wow, that's a lot. So God has brought some of us here. You may have moved here because your Thea lived here and you had nowhere else to go. You know, you may have come here because you love this church and you wanted to come and be a part of this church. You know, God has brought a lot of us here to this mission field. And some of us, we're heroes. We're warriors that were born here. I look at my husband. He was born and raised here. He's like, this is my city. You know, it is. This is our city. This is our city. We are called to the front lines of this city. And there's room at the front lines for all of us. And we're in a great battle for these lost and hurting souls. Do you know that San Diego County has 3 million people? 3 million people. 1% of 3 million is 300,000. I hope my math is right because I'm terrible at math. That's a lot of people. Even 3,000 is a lot of people. And God has placed us strategically in the front lines of this county to be an ambassador for him, to express his love, to share the hope of Jesus Christ. Wherever you are, you are on the front lines of this battle. Whatever building he set you in, whatever job place, whether you're in construction or if you're a plumber or you're working in the, in the high rises of San Diego, that is your front line. That's where God has strategically placed us. And we are being attacked at all sides. There's no hiding. There's no hiding behind somebody like, oh, you get them. I'm going to back you up. No, no, no. Where you're at, we're not there. Where I'm at, you're not there. I can't hide behind you. You're not with me. Man, but we've got to step up and take our place in this front lines. Amen? God has strategically placed us in these locations because there's a great need around us. And sometimes we might look around and say, man, I don't, you know, I don't, everyone's, you know, in business. I work downtown a lot, so I see a lot of business people. And I don't, you don't see it from the outside, but there's a lot of people that are, alcoholics, you know, that are battling suicide, that are having major needs. You know, I met a lawyer who was lost everything and was barely getting his practice back. And in the middle of our, of, our, of the work that we were doing for the, the trial he was on, he ended up relapsing again on alcohol, you know, and it's like these great people have a great, there's a great need for them. This is how we answer the call now is we put ourselves in God's hands and we turn ourselves completely over to him. Our workplace is, is our very own congregation full of hurting people. And we have the platform to preach and to share God's love. And we must be broken for them. We must be bold before them. We must allow the burden of the need around us to be greater than our busyness. Amen. We have been created with this purpose that God would use us. I remember when I was in the Philippines, um, I was very young and I came home and I got a job at Wells Fargo. How many of you have a bank account? No, I'm kidding. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> but I, I got a job at Wells Fargo as a phone bank operator. You know, when you call customer service, I was that person on the line, like, how may I help you? You know? And, but there I felt like, man, God, do you st are you still going to use me? Because I'm sitting here at this a phone bank office in this cubicle, you know, like doing the same thing every day, listening to all these people that aren't managing their money, right? <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, there's great people. But, um, but God began to put it on my heart that, like, this is your field now. So I began to open up my Bible, and I began to start a little Bible study there, you know. And I was only there for a year because then the call came out, and I was able to go minister Mex to Mexico, um, Sister Gina challenged me, God put it on her heart, and I went to Mexico for four years after that. So I ministered to, to some people there, but there was one girl, her name was Monica, and she was cheating on her husband, and she had gotten pregnant from another man, and she was going to get an abortion, and just all this chaos, and I'm like ministering with her and praying for her and believing God, inviting her to church, and, and be, I was broken for her, broken for her. 
And I, I, you know, I just would keep her in my prayers after that. I left to the mission field. You know that a few years ago, we had a discipleship here, and the whole multi region came, and she was the gang girl leader in our Barstow church. I was like, Monica. She's like, Marina. And I was like, what are you, what are you, this is weird. You know, Twilight Zone. This is weird. And it was like, no, God, I, I ended up going to church after you left, and God got a hold of my life, and I'm just answering the call now, and, and I'm here, and I'm the gang girl leader, and God's using me and my husband. And I was just like, whoa, wow, man. Imagine if I just kept my mouth shut at work and just did my job and didn't want to bother anybody, didn't want to. Man, she would have never heard the gospel. She would have never known. But it was my field. Where's your field? What are you doing with your field? The first thing we need to pursue is we need to pursue holiness. Amen? We need to pursue holiness, and we need to pursue God's purpose for our life. And just real quick with holiness, we have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. We can't share God's love if we don't know God's love. We can't talk about Jesus if we haven't spent time with Jesus, you know? We can't, uh, oh, my leader put this on, on Twitter, and this is what I want to share with you. No, no, no. We have to have our own encounters with God. We can't just attend church, attend church and then go out and preach. We've got to spend time with Jesus. We need to know God's power. We need to know what his love is so that we can share it with all convictions. There is an early African uh, converts to Christianity were earnest and regular in private devotions. There was these early converts, African converts. Each one reportedly had a separate spot in the thicket where he would pour out his heart to God. Over time, the past, uh, over time, the paths to these places became well-worn. As a result, if one of these believers began to neglect prayer, it was soon apparent to the others. They would kindly remind the negligent one, brother, the grass grows on your path. Is the grass growing on our path? You know, I've been guilty. I, I've neglected it. I got birthed in prayer. I got birthed in a time where it was like, you know, uh, hours of prayer, not just 15 minutes, not just on our way to work, but hours travailing before God because of the need, because of the burden that God put on our lives. Is there grass growing on your path? Is there grass growing? The world is crying out for holy people, people worth following, not people that are, you know, messing around, not people that are, you know, uh, playing games, playing church. But God is calling people out of their comfort. We don't want casual Christians. God can't use a casual Christian. God can't use a Christian that is socially drinking. At your family parties, a little margarita. No, God can't use that. God doesn't want to use a casual Christian that casually sins, that casually does their thing with God. God wants to use people that are cutting edge, that are separated, that are fully given over to him. And it's not for the person next to you, it's for you, it's for me. We've got to cut those things out, the compromise out. We've got to cut it out. God, God wants to take us places. He wants to do something with our lives, but he can't do it if we're messing around. We got to stop messing around. We got to get serious about it. We can't just be, I'm going to go to church and get my fix. No, we've got to give it our all now. And some of us, we've got to come to these altars. We've got to surrender our sins. We've got to do some confession here at this altar. We've got to let it all go so that God can use us when we go out. Some of our families don't respond because of the way we live. We can't even preach to them anymore because of the way we live. But man, there's time. God is forgiving. If we surrender and we ask for forgiveness now, he can use us. Revival is going to take place here in San Diego. It's taking place. Are we going to be a part of it? Are we going to be on this journey? Are we going to be left behind coming back next year, back at this altar, surrendering ourselves? Man, let's do it now. If not now, then when? This is our great pursuit. And I want us all to stand this morning. We have to understand we're ambassadors. We represent Christ. 
We don't just represent our pastors. And our, we represent Christ. And if people look at us, is this, is this what Christ looks like? We have to pursue him. We have to let go of the baggage, of the, of the excuses. You know, a lot of our trials are self-made. I've been through a lot of trials lately, but I don't blame the devil. I, blame, I know they're self-made. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm not blaming my husband. I know I, I did this to me. So I'm not going to let that hold me back. I'm going to learn from it. I'm going to move forward. We've got to stop making excuses. And this morning, I want to pray. I'm going to pray that we would surrender fully. That we would get it together for him so that he can use us, so that we can fulfill the purpose he created us for. And that's exciting. And the purpose he created you for. Let's pray. God, I come to you this morning. I pray for your people. I pray for myself, Lord. We want to do your will. We want to pursue you, God, so that we, Father God, can do your will, Jesus. Cleanse us, God. If there's some of us that might be uh, feeling insecure, God, we might be feeling insignificant. We might be, be feeling shameful this morning. I surrender that, God. I pray, God, that they would surrender those things to you that may be holding us back, oh God. Oh, we want to take San Diego for you, God. We want to make a mark, God, in this world for you. you we know you want to use this city, God. You want to use this county, God. We pray, God, that you would use us for this city, Jesus. God, and that you would take control, my God, and do something amazing through our lives. God, let us let our testimonies of your love ring throughout this county, Jesus. Let it ring throughout the world, oh God. I pray that you would take control, Lord. We thank you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That was a beautiful word. Thank you, Sister Marina. The great pursuit, right? Are you ready? Wow. Are you ready to pursue God like never before? We still have one more, and we're so um, ex excited to hear her as well. It, it's my privilege to introduce our second speaker. It's, um, she has been saved for 15 years. She's been married for 11 years, and she has three beautiful children. Her quote is, I love living for Jesus. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome up Sister Anna Gomez. I'm sorry, but the fire of God is in me. Amen. Is the fire of God in you? Okay, okay. I'm going to ask that again. Is the fire of God in you? As we're going to talk about the fire of God this morning, you can go ahead and be seated. And we've heard so much already. Oh, my God, so much fire, so I'm going to blow in and blow out. Amen. I'm just going to share briefly because I believe the Holy Ghost wants to move this morning. And before I share my word, I want to thank God for saving me. I thank him. I thank him. I've been 15 years serving Jesus with all my heart, and I love him so, so much. And that's the best decision I made, and the next best decision I made in my life is marrying that awesome man of God right there. My husband, and I'm so grateful. I be, I'm married to a relentless man of God. And also, I want to thank our beautiful pastors, Pastor Al and Sister Georgina. Can we give them a hand this morning? They empower us in our calling and in our gifting. Amen. And this morning, the title of my message is, I can't stop and I won't stop. Amen. Say, I can't stop and say, I won't stop. Amen. We're going to talk about being relentless for God this morning. Amen. And I want us to catch a relentless spirit. If you catch it, you're going to be here for the long haul. You're going to stay on fire. No matter what season you may be in your life, you're going to be in the house of God. You're going to be a builder. You're going to be a trailblazer because you can't stop and you won't stop. Amen. I'm excited this morning. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. And I'm going to go ahead and share it for the sake of time. The word of God says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord enthusiastically because your labor is not 
in vain. I couldn't think of a better relentless scripture than this one. Amen. Serve the Lord enthusiastically with spiritual fervor because your labor is not in vain. Lord, just move, God. Move this morning. Fill your word. I pray from the front to the back. God, that you just move. Your Holy Spirit takes over. In Jesus' name, amen. Being relentless means being persistent, being unflinching, okay? I grew up in a boxing family, so if someone threw a punch and you flinched, you weren't relentless. <laughs> to be unflinching is if you get a punch, you, you go back, amen? You fight back. That's unflinching. To be determined, to be uncompromising, to be consistent, to be constant. And I'm going to give you two more definitions that are in my dictionary. Number one is to be too legit to quit. Amen? When you're relentless, you're too legit to quit. You don't give up. You don't give in. You're too legit for that. You keep going forward. Amen? And my second definition in the dictionary of Ana Gomez is I can't stop and I won't stop. Amen? That's a relentless disciple. That is a relentless man and woman of God. Is there too legit to quit? And they can't stop and they won't stop. Amen? God wants us to catch a relentless spirit this morning. And that's what I caught from every speaker that spoke last week. They, they've been through so much. They have, there's longevity in every single one of those speakers. And what you see inside of them is and, and some of them, that the words were eloquent. Some of them, they were not. It didn't matter. The substance behind their messages. You felt relentlessness. You felt these women did not give up when it got hard. You felt that these women were consistent no matter what season of their life they were in. You felt that these women went forward no matter what. And that's the type of spirit God wants us to catch this morning. If you're new here this morning, you have to catch a relentless spirit. You have to be relentless if you're going to make it for the long haul. You have to be relentless if you're going to serve Jesus with all your heart. Relentless people are passionate people. The stronger your desire, the greater your fire. If, that's, if you have that strong desire inside of you and you say, I'm going to be relentless no matter what, guess what? Your fire is going to be strong. Your fire is going to be great. You're going to attract many people to Jesus because the stronger your desire, the greater your fire. A fire in your heart is going to lift everything in your life. If you have a fire in your heart, it doesn't matter what, you're going to go, what you go through because it lifts you up. Your fire is greater than your trial. Your fire for God is greater than anything that could come your way. That is relentless. When you are going through the trial, but your fire inside of you, because of the God in you, is greater. Amen? Let me ask you this morning, what wakes you up? And what keeps you up? Does Jesus wake you up? Does the fire inside of you wake you up? And not only that, does it keep you up? Do you sometimes leave services saying, I want to go home and pray? Do you sometimes leave services saying, I want to go home and evangelize? Or even in the middle of the service, you can say, i got to text this person, you know? Someone comes on your heart. It keeps you up. The fire, the relentless spirit of God is going to wake you up, and it's going to keep you up. Amen. A person of great passion and few skills always outpour, outperforms a person with great skills and no passion. In the end, your passion, your relentlessness, and your fire is going to have more influence than your experience. It's going to have more influence than your degree. The passion and the fire and the relentlessness inside of you. Because we see all the time people taking their own lives taking their own lives, putting the degree. The degree didn't matter when they were in the hardest season of their life, right? The relentless fire of God is going to keep you, and that's going to be your greatest influence is your passion and your fire. And that's what God is doing in me. Anna, just feed your fire every day. That's all I'm asking you to do is stay on fire for me, is get a hold of me, is to be in my throne room because you have access to everything the throne room has to offer. And if you stay there, if you wake up, if you discipline yourself, if you make your body your slave, 
you're going to be all right. Just focus on your fire. Be relentless in your fire for God. Even when you read the book of Acts, what does it say? That these men were unschooled, ordinary men, and that people realized that they were with Jesus. Those were relentless men. They were worried. If you go to John 14 and John 16, they were worried. They would say, Jesus, what are we going to do when you leave us? They were worried. You know what Jesus told him? Jesus said, don't worry. I'm going to give you a helper. I'm going to give you an advocate. I'm going to give you someone that's going to fill you. And when he fills you, he's another. You know what that word another means? It means he's just like me. He thinks like me. He performs miracles like me. He acts like me. He's just like me. And he's going to be in you. And then you go to fast forward to the book of Acts, and guess what? That another came, and that fire came, and they were doing exactly what Jesus did. They were healing. They were laying hands. They were preaching. And that another, I want to tell you, is here with us. You know what? I was praying, and I said, God, give me a word. Give me a word. I went old school. I didn't even type it out. I said, God, give me a word. And you know what he told me? He said, Anna, I want you to preach to the people that don't come to church all the time. Tell them I want to feel them. Tell them I want to, them to experience the fire of God. Tell them I want them to be relentless and experience what it is to fully serve me wholeheartedly, to be fully engulfed in me. Amen? The first point, if we're going to be burning for God, then we have to prioritize abiding. And notice I said prioritize. I want to ask you two questions. Is Jesus first in your life? Is Jesus first in your life? And number two, do you have a relationship with God that goes outside of your Sunday morning attendance? You know, and I have this illustration really quick. You know, you, if you look at this plant, there's no flowers. It's dry, right? It's not beautiful. Then if you look at this plant, actually the woman at the store is like, you really want to buy that? Because <laughs> it's not attracting. Like, it's dying. Why are you going to buy that? You're wasting your money. And you look here and all these flowers. And I thought about it. I said, Lord, when we come and we're not in church, if we're just Sunday mornings all we get, we bring this to God. Every Sunday, we bring this. Hey, God, give me some flowers. I need some flowers. You know, may, or, or we take our plans, and we, and we have our plans, and we say, God, bless this. You know, bless this, God. Please put some flowers, some fruit on there. But that's backwards. The word of God says to seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all things are going to be added unto you. And I came to tell you, put God first. Put God first. And don't, you're not just a Sunday Christian. You're Monday, you're waking up praising God. Tuesday, you're waking up seeking his face. Wednesday night, you stay up talking to him. You pull out that devotional. And then when you come on Sunday, you're bringing some flowers. You're bringing some fruit. And you're saying, God, bless this. Touch this. God, use my life. You're already bringing the fire of God with you on Sundays. Amen. We have to prioritize abiding. Jesus has to be first. Jesus has to be first. Number two, we need to strategize on building. A relentless person has a strategy to build. They don't just show up. There's a plan. There's, there's goals. There's a focus. There's a purpose. There's a, I got to do this. I want to do this. I want to do that for God. The highest level of living is giving. The highest level of living is giving. And I came to tell you this morning that we are all called to build this church. These two rows in the front, they're not the only ones that are called to build this church. You in the back, you in the middle, I'm not pointing anybody out, but your gift, you're, we are a body, and we are joined, and we are needed to, knitted together. And if we're not all doing our parts like we don't have a pinky, or we're walking around without an arm, it's awkward, right? It's difficult. And I want you to know that you are valued, that we love you, that you belong here. And that's why we offer so much family life flow, life groups, campus life, because we want you to be a part of this body. And I believe the next God-sized idea is in you. Amen? Also, build your legacy. Every single one of us in here are in charge of our own legacy. 
sometimes we're focused on the now. And we don't make decisions that are about that are going to affect the future. And uh, and that's one. I'm a first generation Christian in my family. I'm the first one to get saved out of my brothers. I have five brothers, and I'm the first generation Christian. And when I got saved, the first thing God promised me was my family. And they came to church the second month. All of us were in church, and I was like, "Yes, it happened! Woo! It happened!" They didn't all come to church the next week. <laughs> It didn't happen right away, and it's still happening. But I'm a first-generation Christian. Then when I came to San Diego, oh, so thankful God brought me to San Diego. And God just showed me more. Anna, just, just stay in my will. Don't worry about your family. I got them. Stay in my will. And that's what I've been doing. I've been here 13 years. And then recently, my brother passed away in March. And, um, you know, it was tough. In 13 years, I have never spent more than three days in Arizona, ever, in 13 years. So when my brother passed away, I was there two weeks straight, two weeks straight, living with all my family. And I was like, wow, okay, Lord. And I just remember almost every night on my knees praying. I said, God, you promised me a spiritual legacy. You promised me that they would be saved. I would go outside. My brother's still drinking. Come on, brother. God has a plan for you. God has a plan for you. Three, uh, three o'clock in the morning, knocking on the door, going outside. Brother, God has a plan for you. It's more than that bottle. It's more than that can. You're a cult. You're a pastor. You got a good heart. That alcohol is robbing you. Six o'clock in the morning, he was still outside. But I just go on my knees and prayed. And I prayed those two weeks. I prayed. Came back home. I went back the next weekend. And I said, Lord, give me a word. You know what he told me? He goes, Anna. I'm going to push back the hand of Egypt. I'm going to push the hand of Egypt back. Egypt represents the world. Egypt represents that alcohol. Egypt represents every generational curse. I'm pushing that hand back. Don't worry, Anna. I got this. And when I went home, guess what? I came back with the miracle. I came back with the miracle. And I want you to know my nephew, Manny, who my brother that passed away, that's his first child. That's his first child. We didn't really know him. And God brought him back. And it was his decision to be here. We did not force him. He said, I want to finish. I want to continue my dad's legacy. And it was his decision to be here. And, I've, and we're, we're barely building our relationship. He's 23 years old. But look how beautiful God is. God is so good. But I came to tell you that are fighting for your family. You have to be the Noah. You have to stick it out no matter what. Even if nobody else wants to get in the boat, you get in that boat. Because I think about my kids, too. And I said, I got to do this for my kids. And secondly, you women, you have to be that Esther. If I perish, I perish. I'm going to fight for this. I'm going to take my place. I'm going to be at my post. As we go ahead and stand, and I just want to say that, my motivation, really, when it comes to legacy, as I think of the Arkansas family, I see Pastor said he's a strategic sacrifice so much. You read Treasures Out of Darkness. If you have not read that book, you need to go to the bookstore and you need to pick up that book. It will change your life forever. That's what gave me hope. That's what gave me hope. And I read Treasures Out of Darkness, and I said, that's what I want. I want that for my family. And it's caused me to fight. And I see Sister Judy, you know, all five of their kids are building this ministry. Your kids are your greatest fruit. All five of Pastor Sunny and Sister Julie's children are building this ministry, but not just their children, are their grandchildren are. Do you see the now, beautiful as it now up here? That's what I want to fight for, but I, I have to do my part. And that brings me to my last point is that if you're going to be a relentless person, you have to embrace change. You have to be a person that's willing to change. And it's not just in the beginning. For me, letting go of the bad music or my lifestyle, the party lifestyle, that wasn't that hard for me because God radically touched my life. I just threw it out the window. I was fine with that. But it's the process of maturity, you know, and the process of, God, you're not understanding the season you're in. And that's not the way you pictured it, right? But you have to embrace change. And we're as close to God as we want to be. We're, we have to be relentless about this pursuit of him. And not too long ago, we had a meeting. 
we had a meeting with our pastors, and they shared their heart for this church. And I want you to know, you want to know what keeps our pastors up at night? Is every single one of our growth in here. Every single one of our growth. Every single one of us walking in the fullness of God. You might think they don't even notice you. But I want you to know they notice you. And they ask about you. Because they care. They strategize for this church. They have put campus life in place. They have put life groups. I pray every single one of us after this message, we get connected to a life group. We get connected to a life group, wherever that flower went. And you're going to start seeing flowers. You're going to start seeing a spiritual growth you have never seen in your life. And let me tell you what, you're going to get addicted to that growth. When I started seeing how God was changing me, my mind, the decisions, the wisdom I get from God. Wow, this is amazing. I want this. And I still want this. Do you have a passion to grow? Is it in you? We're not. I'm sorry, we're not a religious church. You're going to be challenged every time you come to a service here. You're going to be challenged to grow. You are going to be challenged. You're going to be provoked. And you're going to be challenged to grow. But the truth of the matter is that our growth depends on us. And I am praying, I am praying that we catch that relentless spirit to grow. That we catch that relentless heart. I'm not going to stop. I'm too legit to quit. I won't stop. I'm constant. I'm consistent. I'm dedicated to this. And no matter what comes my way, I'm going to show up to life group. And no matter what comes my way, I'm going to finish the family life flow. And no matter what comes my way, I'm going to get up. And I'm going to pray with that leader that's been inviting me to pray in the morning. I'm a disciple. Right? And as we go ahead and stand, and we're, we're standing, we go ahead and lift our hands. We're going to sing a song. And as we sing this song, I want you to take, the greatest change happens when we take a self-evaluation. I did this last year, and I said, Lord, it's me, God. It's me. I'm not feeding my fire, God. I'm not changing, God. I'm not maturing, God. It's me. And that's what I want us to do this morning. We're going to catch a heart for growth, a personal strategy. We're going to be relentless about wanting to grow in God. And I pray if you've never made an altar call, that you make one this morning, that this is your first step to say, I'm going to grow. I'm going to be relentless as they sing the song. It's not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. Oh, my life.